This program is brought to you by Grand Valley State University. Uh, thank you everyone for coming this evening. Uh, I will speak for uh, the panelists when I say we uh, welcome you here and we're very happy that everybody was able to make it tonight in this what is to us cold weather. Um, I have the, ju the honor of both introducing our panelists for the evening as well as moderating the discussion that I believe will be um, really stimulating and interesting. We have a wealth of perspectives uh, from these three folks that sit on the stage with me. And uh, so I would like to get this started. I will introduce to you first uh, Mr. Michael Tanner, who heads research on health care reform and social welfare policy and social security for the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. Under Mr. Tanner's direction, Cato launched the Project on Social Security Choice, which is widely considered the leading impetus for transforming the soon-to-be-bankrupt system into a private savings program. His most recent book, Leviathan on the Right, How Big Government Conservatism Brought Down the Republican Revolution, in 2007, chronicles the demise of the Republican Party as it has shifted away from its limited government roots and warns that reform is necessary to avoid continual electoral defeat. Mr. Tanner's writings have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. He also appears regularly on network and cable news programs. Before joining Cato in 1993, Tanner served as Director of Research of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation and its Legislative Director for the American Legislative Exchange Council. Please help me in welcoming him. <laughs> Mr. Timothy Noah is a senior writer for Slate Magazine where he writes the Chatterbox column and, a contribute, and is a contributing editor to the Washington Monthly. He was previously an assistant managing editor at U.S. News and World Report, a Washington, a Washington reporter for the Wall Street Journal, a staff writer at the New Republic, and a congressional correspondent for Newsweek. Mr. Noah is a television and radio commentator with issue, uh, on issues surrounding politics and the media. He appears frequently on CNN, PBS NewsHour with Jim Lehrer, and National Public Radio. Mr. Noah is a graduate of Harvard University, graduating cum laude in 1980. He was an editor of the Harvard Advocate, and he currently lives with us in Washington, D.C. Please help me welcome him. And last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Thomas Miller is currently a resident fellow for healthcare policy and regulation at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining AEI, Mr. Miller was a senior health economist for the Joint Economic Committee. A lawyer by training and a former journalist, Mr. Miller has worked on issues ranging from Medicare prescription drug benefits to medical savings accounts. While at the Joint Economic Committee, he worked on Social Security reform legislation and organized a number of hearings that focused on reforms in private health care markets. His articles and political commentary have appeared in publications from the Council on Foreign Relations, Medical Progress Today, and the National Review. Mr. Miller is a graduate of Duke Law School and did undergraduate work at New York University. Please help me in welcoming, welcoming him warmly. <laughs> So before we begin, I would like to just start uh, by being transparent with you about how this evening will go. Uh, we, the first question will be posed, and each respondent and panelist will have 10 minutes to respond to that question. Uh, we will then take on the next question, where each respondent will have 10 minutes, and then there will be five minutes of rebuttal, and we will follow that uh, with 30 minutes of Q&A from all of you. So get your pens ready, and get ready to be engaged. Uh, the first question that we're going to pose for uh, each of you, and we're going to do it in the order in which I introduce you, is what should the proper role of government be in health care? Meaning, what should be the balance between free market regulation and regulation in health care? And I, I'm going to start with Mr. Tanner. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to, to thank the college for having uh, me here. Uh, getting a chance to see Grand Rapids and explore the, uh, the warming trend. Uh, actually, I, mean, I really am thrilled to be here. It is, it is a lovely city, uh, but I, I will warn you a little bit about that. See, I not only work, but I live in Washington, D.C., so it's always a pleasure to be somewhere else. Uh, the question on what is 
the proper role of government when it comes to health care, I, I actually have a, a slightly different question, which is, what makes anyone think the government can run a health care system? I mean, the health care systems it runs today are remarkable failures. Uh, the VA system uh, mistreats our veterans. The Medicaid system provides poor quality at a high cost. And the Medicare system, depending on which accounting measure you want to use, is somewhere between 50 and 100 trillion, that's trillion with a T, dollars in debt going forward. That's not exactly an inspiring track record. But I would also suggest that if you look at the problems that are facing the U.S. healthcare system, and we have some very significant problems facing our system, that the vast majority, if not all of them, are actually caused by the government. Take, for example, the number of people without health insurance. What is the largest reason why people become uninsured? Well, it's because they lose their jobs. And when you lose your job under our system, you lose your health insurance. Because in this country, we tie health insurance to employment. Now, when you think about it, what sense does that really make? You know, you don't get your homeowner's insurance at work. Your boss doesn't pick out your auto insurance for you. You don't generally get your life insurance on your job. So why should you get your health insurance at work? You know, having health insurance at work means, number one, you don't get to pick it. Your boss does. You know, you might want to see a particular doctor, but your boss decides in order to save money, he's going to join this new, cheaper HMO over here, and your doctor's not part of that. So you're out of luck. But you don't get a say in that. And second, it means that if you lose your job, you lose your insurance. You don't lose your auto insurance when you lose your job, or your homeowner's insurance, or your life insurance, but you lose your health insurance. Why would we come up with a system like that? Well, it actually has to do with an historical accident. You go back to World War II, and you had two problems simultaneously. You had a labor shortage, because all the guys were over at the front, and you had government-imposed wage price controls, which meant that businesses couldn't compete for the remaining workers on the basis of raising wages. So they began to try to get around that by offering health insurance. And then to make matters worse, in 1953, the IRS decided that employer-provided health insurance was a tax-free benefit. That means that if you get your health insurance through work, it's tax-free to you. You know, if you're getting paid, let's say, $50,000, and your boss gives you a $10,000 insurance policy, as far as your boss is concerned, he's paying you $60,000. It doesn't make any difference to him. But you're only paying taxes on that $50,000. Well, suppose the boss turned around and gave you a raise, gave you a $10,000 raise, and said, here's $60,000. Now go out and buy your own health insurance. You'd have to pay taxes on all $60,000. You'd be worse off. So the incentive created by our tax code pushes you into getting your health insurance at work. That means your health insurance is not personal, doesn't belong to you, and it's not portable. You can't take it with you from job to job. Second group of people who are uninsured are young people. And what's the biggest reason why? Well, because they can't afford the insurance. But government regulations drives up the cost of insurance. According to a study out of Duke University, government regulations add as much as $168 billion every year to the cost of insurance. This is particularly true to, for young people because we require that insurance instead of protecting them against getting hit by a truck or coming down with cancer or something like that, must cover all manner of special interest provisions, providing for various provider groups and disease constituencies and so on. You know, just imagine that if the only time, you know, when you went out to buy a car, the government mandated that the only car you were allowed to buy was a Lexus. How long would it be before there were too few people with cars and we had a real problem 
there, especially for young people buying their first car. Sometimes you've got to go out and buy a probe or something to start. And in addition to that, government protects the insurance companies, creating little cartels so there's no competition. You know, President Obama is exactly right when he talks about how little competition there is in the insurance industry, where one company in North Dakota controls 92% of the insurance market. One company in Alabama has 86% of the market. In New York State, it's 70% of the market divided up between two companies and so on. Why is this? There are 1,300 insurance companies nationwide. 500 of them are nonprofit insurance companies. So why should two or three companies control the market like that? It's because it's illegal under government rules right now to buy that insurance anywhere but companies in your state. You live here in Michigan. If you could find a cheaper insurance policy in Illinois or Wisconsin or for that matter go online to eSurance and find the cheapest policy in the country, it's illegal for you to buy that insurance. If we really wanted to create competition to hold the insurance companies and make them honest, instead of creating a single government entity that's just going to put them all out of business and create a single monopoly run by the government, why don't we open it up and force all 1,300 insurance companies to compete with one another? the way they have to compete for other goods and services, the way that brings down prices and improves quality. And finally, we do the same thing when it comes to providers. We limit the scope of practice for nurse practitioners and physician's assistants and dental hygienists and on and on and on. What we do is create little monopoly cartels for the providers as well, limiting competition. You know, if you look to other areas of the economy, you can see what free markets do. Take computers. Now, none of you will remember this, but once upon a time, computers cost $100,000 or more, and they were as big as a house. You know, today they're $9.95, and you have one in your cell phone. Why? It wasn't because the government somehow created a new giant computer, government-run computer industry to compete with Microsoft. And it wasn't because we put a whole lot of new regulations and price controls and things like that on computers. It was because competition drove down costs and improved quality. And that's what markets do. On the other hand, government doesn't respond to individual or market preferences. They don't even know what market preferences are. They don't have a clue what the average American really wants. They respond to the special interests and the lobbyists and the people in Washington who can get their ear, which is why the health care systems they've developed don't work. You know, I've done a, a lot of studies of healthcare systems around the world. And I can tell you there are some countries where healthcare works pretty well. And there are other countries where it doesn't. But I can tell you almost universally that those countries that work the best are those that have incorporated market mechanisms in their healthcare system. And those that work the worst are those with government command and control, centralized, bureaucratic, government-run healthcare system. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now we'll ask Mr. Noah to please step up. <clears throat> what should the government's proper role be in health care? <clears throat> Um, you're getting a journalist's perspective uh, rather than an academic's. Um, but I think the government should assume a strong role in health care. Uh, one route is what's called single payer, where the government provides health insurance to all. That's the Canadian system. Another route is strict regulation of insurers, 
That's how they do it in France and Germany. The health care reform bill currently before Congress conforms to neither model. Opponents of the bill say it will lead to one or the other. I say we should be so lucky. At best, it's a tiny step in the direction of option two, strict regulation. But in the strict regulation model, other countries typically require health insurers to provide basic coverage on a nonprofit basis. No one's talking about that here. Why do I think government should take such a strong role? Why not leave it to free enterprise? Well, free enterprise is great. Capitalism is the greatest method ever devised for creating wealth. God bless it. But it can't do everything. Um, and one thing it does especially badly is provide health care to everyone who needs it. In fact, capitalism's very efficiency, which is a blessing in so many ways, is a hindrance when it comes to the distribution of health care. That's because it has an inherent bias toward making sick people pay for their own treatment. Health insurance is supposed to make everybody pay uh, more or less equally. The risk of having to pay for doctors and hospital visits is supposed to be shared. But the market works to undermine that. The people least likely to get sick, including young people, buy cheap health insurance policies or no health insurance policies at all. That means the people most likely to get sick, including older people, are overrepresented in the standard policies. To pay for their medical treatment, the insurer must raise premiums, but that drives away even more of the customers who are least likely to get sick, which compels the insurer to raise premiums still higher. Experts call this adverse selection. The very real result is that a lot of people end up with no health insurance at all. That's about 45 million people in the United States. About 20% of these folks are immigrants, many of them illegal immigrants, but most are American citizens. We're not talking about people on welfare. If you're on welfare, there's a government program, Medicaid, that provides health insurance. Not great health insurance, but it's something. But the uninsured are a different group. More than 80% of them are families where at least one person is working, 70% uh, full time. These are people who play by the rules, work for a living, but they can't get health insurance because it's been priced out of reach. In some cases, they had health insurance, then got very sick, and the insurer's response was to comb through the paperwork uh, they filled out when they first bought the policy. If the insurer can find some minor detail in the policyholder's medical history that he or she forgot to put in, the insurer can cut that person off. Robin Beaton, a retired nurse in Texas, was rescinded two years ago by Blue Cross and Blue Shield after she was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. Blue Cross said this was because she had neglected to state on her forms that she had been treated previously for acne. Uh, this is standard practice. It's called rescission. It's perfectly legal, and insurers have said that as long as the government lets them do it, they'll keep doing it. That's the magic of the marketplace. What do these uninsured people do? They stay away from doctors until they get sick, really sick. Then they show up at emergency rooms. There's a myth out there that the nation's emergency rooms provide adequate socialized medicine to the uninsured. So what's the problem, a lot of people say. Well, there are three problems. The first problem is that ignoring your symptoms until you get really sick is not a good way to stay healthy. If you've got something serious, your disease has had a chance to worsen. The second problem is that while it's true emergency rooms usually take all comers, it's not true that they do it free of charge. They send you a bill, rarely for less than $1,000, more often several thousand. The rates are actually higher for the uninsured than they are for insured patients because insurance companies get a volume discount. The hospitals hire collection agencies. Anyone they can get money out of, they get the money. The third problem is that to the extent emergency rooms can't collect the money, they run up a lot of expenses. To cover them, they jack up prices on everybody else. Even if you have health insurance, your problems aren't necessarily over because policies have caps on spending or shift costs to policyholders in other ways. 62% of bankruptcies in the US were linked to medical spending according to a 2007 study published in the American Journal of Medicine. Of these, nearly 80% were for people who had health insurance. Their average out-of-pocket expenses were $18,000. The uninsured average out-of-pocket ex uh, expenses were nearly $27,000. But to those who say, let the market fix this, I say, the market had its chance. Can the federal government handle this task? It already handles a little less than half through Medicare, Medicaid, 
the Veterans Administration, and a few other programs. These programs have their difficulties, but they all manage to keep costs below the level found in the private sector, and most of them provide better coverage. Ask your grandmother if she'd like to stop receiving Medicare. Medicaid is too stingy, mainly because of the stigma attached to its low-income recipients. But the Veterans Administration is a socialist paradise. Government provides not just the insurance, but the doctors and hospitals too. And economists have found the VA's quality of care markedly superior to that in the private sector. This is one of the great untold stories in the healthcare debate. People don't want to hear it. Um, you can read about it in a book by Philip Longman called Best Care Anywhere. Full disclosure, I wrote the introduction. We live in the richest country in the world with an economy unmatched when it comes to creating wealth. But when we spend that wealth on health care, the result is waste, poor access, and lower life expectancy than in Canada, France, England, Spain, or Japan. It's time to recognize that the free market doesn't know how to provide all Americans decent access to health care. And Mr. Miller. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, my remarks will conclude what I would say is more of the theoretical approach uh, to the discussion of, of, of health care. Uh, and, and we need to remember that we're talking about the role of government in health care, not just in health insurance, not even just in health care. What we really should think about are what's the priorities, what's the role of the government in what we should care about, which is your better health or maintaining it. Uh, so we sometimes overemphasize the health insurance side to the exclusion of the more important ones. Uh, we're in, you know, always going to be somewhere in the middle of a continuum. We're never going to, in our country, be at either extreme. A single payer is dreamed of by some. Uh, a much freer, not a completely free market, as, as hoped for by others. Uh, the equilibrium drifts towards some type of hybrid, uh, but it's always less fuel efficient. Uh, our politics uh, tends to favor the outward appearance of privately owned and operated health care, but still kept pretty tightly tethered to political rules uh, and limits. Almost, if you will, in the insurance sense, a, a captive insurer. Uh, the role is to take the blame uh, and allow for plausible deniability uh, regarding what would otherwise be the blame for full uh, public and political control. Uh, what the latest legislation was threatening to produce was uh, closer to the regulated utility model, or as some in the private sector prefer, profit side capitalism and loss side socialism. Uh, we're already well out of balance in finding where we need to be on this continuum. Uh, the actual spending breakdown, it's, a, it's moving a little bit with the latest numbers. It's not quite a 50-50 split explicitly between what's paid for publicly and what's paid for privately. But if you look at the long-term trends, it's definitely moving toward the public side. The recent legislation would have pushed it further, at least to the 55% level uh, within the near term, and even more when you include the tax subsidies we spend publicly uh, for private health care. It's going to grow greater in the direction of more public control, just due to the aging of the population uh, with the programs that serve that population, the Medicare drug benefit expansion, the expansions of Medicaid already underway, more hope for, uh, and the erosion of uh, uh, supplemental health care for retirees. Uh, there's additional influence of the public sector through regulation, and its role is a more dominant uh, payer, which uh, sets most of the trends for what other players are going to do in the health care field. All of this is compounded, well, all of this really compounds the larger problem of third-party payment and control of our health care decisions, uh, which drive up the cost of health care far beyond its value. We've been doing this for decades. Uh, in the United States, we are actually at the low end of this continuum, uh, where less than 12% of every dollar of all of our health care spending is paid first party out of pocket. Uh, you can compare us to other countries around the world. We are well below the average of the major industrialized countries in the Organization of Economic and Cooperating, uh, actually I just say OECD, I want to do the shorthand thing there. Uh, but the only ones below us are, are France, uh, as good, we always count on them, uh, Netherlands and Luxembourg, Belgium dropped out of the Benelux, Ireland and the UK. Uh, many of the other countries we think have socialized systems are actually above us, Germany, uh, Canada, uh, Japan, 21 other countries uh, overall uh, 
above the U.S. on that group of 27. Uh, so we're, we're at the low end of that. Now, when we think about turning over the keys to the health care car uh, to the government, we need to first ask a, a question. Is the government going to be a competitor with others or more of a predator? Uh, we can presume but find out it's not true that the government is going to be an honest broker or overseer when it begins to combine the multiple roles of regulator, purchaser, and operator in the same body and then further has monopoly control over all the others who are nominally uh, their competitors. Uh, we often talk uh, in theory about market failure. We need to look more closely at government failure in practice. The government as it acts rather than as we imagine, uh, just as there's no such thing as perfect competition, there's no such thing as perfect public decision makers. The temptation, of course, is always to compound one mistake with another, to reach further, to perfect what is not imperfectible in these areas, and go well beyond what's needed uh, to uh, what actually instead is the primary goal, transferring power and control. Uh, this leads us into a uh, mixed web, as we saw in the recent legislation, of health insurance exchanges needing subsidies, which leads to price limits, to mandates, to benefits promises, each one boosting the other one further and further up that spiral. Uh, but what it's really about is let's shave off the edges and force this uh, into some type of uniformity, not for the benefit of consumers and patients, but actually for the convenience of politicians and regulators. So what you don't want to do is replace one less powerful monopoly in portions of our healthcare system, insurers and providers, with an even more powerful one, which is accountable ultimately to no one, uh, the centralized government. The backroom deals that were complained about, we saw recently, they really reflect the problem that the stakes are getting too high in what we say is uh, essential for us to do in healthcare. We're trying to settle and centralize too much through political means. These political markets don't clear and adjust as quickly and frequently as economic ones, uh, and put this into the mix of the modern entitlement state makes whatever is done is a uh, unbounded promise, an extremely brittle one that remains hard to re-examine later. So what we don't want to do is have the government as the main car dealer in a casino in which you're not sure what health care you're going to get until you've worked it through the political process. You don't want to further obscure the real from the contrived, contorted, and distorted in the health care prices and decisions you're facing. Government should be a more reliable partner, not destabilizing with constantly shifting policies or badly executed ones. We can't really, through the government, pretend to pay everyone else's bill or no one is actually coming out ahead in the transaction and it's causing a lot of extra costs along the way. Every dollar that we have to raise to spend through political and public means leads to additional losses in terms of our net welfare because it's more costly uh, than, than simply the cost of that dollar being spent. It's essential not to jeopardize the foundations and incentives of our economic growth, which that process tends to do. Well, that's a negative view. Let's talk about a positive view because I can give you a positive view and a proper role for government in health care. It isn't to deliver care, per se, to innovate, to produce money or new products on its own. That's not really what government does very well. But it can ensure that promises are honored, contracts are enforced, and mechanisms are set up to resolve disputes peacefully and effectively. And it can provide an essential infrastructure of information and help bring together stakeholders, gather and aggregate data, set up some weights and measures so you know what's going on in healthcare, and do some basic research before it's applied more effectively in more narrow channels. Government should try to be a neutral party rather than another self-interested one and refrain from mission creep, get the basics right first. What about fairness? Well, you need to be fair in terms of treating those who are alike in similar ways, but don't force different square pegs into the same round hole. There are concepts of horizontal and vertical equity honored in the breach in most government programs. It's better to facilitate a fair process than to guarantee a particular end result, guaranteeing everyone they're treated the same in the process rather than that their outcomes will be the same. We do need to help to protect the vulnerable. There's a role for government in this regard to protect against undue loss and hardship. The points beyond which market signals just don't mean very much because people have been pounded too hard and can't pay attention to them anymore. Some caps on catastrophic losses, not discretionary ones to limit costs exposure and ensure the delivery of a socially acceptable minimum standard of care but remember that one man's ceiling may not be another man's floor. Uh, we need to allow markets to do what they do best, but not leave the tail of the distribution behind. There are ways to do this within the current insurance market, which deals with the small problem rather than the large problem. And in spending other people's money, government needs to follow its fiduciary duty to protect 
the interests of those taxpayers and the people who earned the money originally and increase the value of what we're spending that on. So certainly we're going to always have a current Medicare and Medicare Medicaid program for better or for worse. It's important that we don't waste the money terribly while we're doing things imperfectly. There's an obligation to taxpayers to get better results. And certainly government can help everyone begin to optimize at least the marginal values of the last dollar they spend or someone spends on their behalf, help people find their own balance, setting on their own place on the continuum of where they are on choices, and allow them to find their spot in terms of how much autonomy or dependency they wish to dial up for themselves, not treating people as guinea pigs or lab rats, nor I perfectly idealized decision makers, but unlock what we're currently doing rather than lock up even more, find a balance to help make choices and responsibilities for them more transparent, insist on accountability by all payers. So to wrap up, health markets need to, do need to become more value maximizing, accountable, dynamic, consumer-centered, consensual, equitable, and sustainable. We're not there yet, and it's not perfect in that regard, but we're more likely to get in that direction by having people given the ability to vote with their wallets on many occasions rather than once every generation or two at the ballot. More frequent, smaller adjustments and direct feedback will get us more of what we wish to have. Thank you. So I, I think that you can see now how uh, wonderful this this balance is of thoughts and ideas around not just government or non-government and health care, but then how do we move forward in this debate on health care policy? Um, one of the things that was brought up by Mr. Miller uh, that I want to, uh, for the students in the audience, um, make clear is that this debate is about health care insurance. Uh, we talked a little bit about this today for those who were at the talk today, um, but that this debate is about providing access to health care. This debate may be less about quality quality of care, maybe less about what we're calling social determinants, um, but is more focused on this idea of access to health care. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to actually ask Mr. Miller to take on this next question, uh, which uh, is based on uh, actually a quote that he had uh, recently uh, in, in a blog that said, trying to do less in Washington would accomplish more everywhere else. And I liked the idea of that quote and wanted him to expound on that a little bit in question two, uh, which is why or why won't the health care reform bill as we know it today improve health care in America, uh, remembering that this is a bill about access, potentially not about quality of care, but may have some implications for quality of care. So I'll ask Mr. Miller first to take that on, uh, if you will. You should never say something that sounds good without then expecting people to elaborate on it. But, but, but basically, you know, to deal with that end of the question and the larger trappings of the bill, we have overloaded the circuit breakers of our political system in this last year of exercise. Uh, you can imagine that all things can be worked out if you just write another hundred pages in a piece of legislation and then wait for the regulations to come. But it turns out that what really matters in our health care system is not who wins or loses marginally in getting a few more dollars or a few less. It's our people out in the population living healthier lives, than they did before. How can we assist them in that regard? How can they be incentivized to do it? Because if those more demands come into the system, the same system will deliver a more expensive, less perfect result. And how are the many wonderful healthcare providers, physicians and others, treating them more effectively so they do it right the first time, with less complications, with fewer additional intensive services. If we can't solve those two problems, which this legislation did very little to have say about, other than how to move the financing around, we're missing the boat. You can, you can, you can move the financing around to some degree, but it, it basically is making the rubble bounce in terms of the underlying problem. Let me kind of uh, take the, the, the quick thumbnail on, on what we basically were getting out of what seems to be thankfully uh, parked on the sidelines for a moment. I have to digress for just a moment. I, I do appreciate what the president was able to accomplish. It's a unique uh, triple header. Uh, he's been able to uh, leave Republicans united, uh, Democrats divided, and independents disaffected. That, that's hard to accomplish all in uh, one single, single fell swoop. You've got the voters of Massachusetts asking for help and relief from a Republican candidate. Uh, these are you know, remarkable steps. Uh, uh, the line is not l lying down with the lamb, but we're getting close to that. There was actually an opinion poll, uh, the Pew Research Center for January. I was uh, stunned to actually see that 
This legislative process accomplished this result. In polling people, it turns out that more people now believe that they would rather, they would more trust private insurance companies to decide the types of uh, procedures uh, that, will be that will be covered by health insurance than the government. 45% would rather trust health insurers than 31% would trust the government. This is a transformation of what are ingrained views and attitudes uh, that were attempted to be exploited in the undergoing debate. So what did we really get out of the latest versions of the bill, whether it's House or Senate, uh, that look like they're not going forward? We do know that whatever was going to be produced would be more expensive than advertised. Uh, it's important to pay attention to the gross amount of what's spent rather than the net amount. We heard a lot about uh, net deficit uh, neutral or deficit reduction, but the fully loaded version was extremely expensive and, and, and it in fact increased what was otherwise going to be the federal budgetary commitment to health care and the overall level of health care spending in the economy once you get into the out years. Uh, we were stressing the resources we have available, which are running a little short, without changing many of the worst features of the current system. Uh, we had mandates that ended up being generally softer uh, than first envisioned. Uh, the political feedback in our system would simply not tolerate harsh mandates. We had these uh, artificial firewalls where some people would get special subsidies, very generous ones, and other people in similar circumstances would not if they happened to get insurance from their employer. Uh, the political feedback over time would not make that sustainable. It was a very contorted process of you get this, but you don't get that. It depends how you worked out in the political process. Uh, we had a, a version of the public plan which is much lighter than the original one. We were going to do it by other means through regulation and surrogates uh, following political signals. Uh, what this really did was it threatened to lock up uh, almost uh, a, a wide range of the most significant health care decisions we make so that they all had to be run through politics and we would be arguing about health care through politics on a 24-7, 365 basis. One way or the other, if you wanted to get something done in health care, you'd have to go through more political toll gates uh, to get permission and struggle for marginal advantage. Uh, this was all about the politics of political dependency, uh, trying to divert uh, citizens from the inadequacies of what was being produced by political means by then demonizing other targets, our favorite ones, of course, being insurers, but now we're going after bankers. Uh, and of course, this was such a complex matter that like that Christmas uh, toy that you're getting for your children, it came with a big sticker, even if the legislation was produced, which would say, some assembly is required. Uh, the entire thing was administratively unworkable. Now, without even more explicit price controls, uh, more directly to nominally drive down the prices of uh, some of these items, we were left with uh, two primary uh, cost-saving uh, devices, a Cadillac tax uh, and a Medicare commission, once called the IMAC, which was kind of a, a rationing app. Um, the Cadillac tax was never really driven by efficiency reasons. Uh, it was much more our cost constraints. It was just one other place to grab some revenue and do it in a particularly contorted way. Uh, it also highlighted the randomness who wins and loses when the dealing was done, uh, where it turns out that some folks paid it, other folks didn't. And for some folks, such as unions, uh, they were willing to settle on an agreement which said that they would be uh, exempted from the tax uh, until perpetuity or forever, whichever came earlier. Um, <laughs> What we should have been, you know, it wasn't about, uh, the right way to do it was about kind of sending some signals on the margin for people to understand that there's an, not, there is not an inexhaustible supply of tax subsidies. We can help you to some degree, but it's limited. If we help everyone, it's less targeted to those who actually do it. Uh, but the other alternative on this front was to go to the Medicare payroll tax hike, which operated as a surrogate for what was once the income surtax uh, in a different manner. The whole unseemliness of uh, buying off the insider interest groups, uh, compounded by more on, about buying in the Senate, just told us that there was too much being run through the politics as usual. The stakes were too high for people not to hold out for their last little marginal advantage. At the same time, we had the usual government combination of trying to slam on the brakes in these uh, measures I just mentioned before, not very well. At the same time, the rest of the government was slamming down its other foot on the accelerator, telling everyone else you don't have to pay very much out of pocket, you're going to be subsidized and that'll be fine. So you get a chain reaction where we're wiring all the weaknesses and limits of insurance rules, mandates, subsidies, and benefit promises while pushing demand up, but we couldn't quite be coercive enough to do it or conscript enough private money to make it all add up to hide the full costs. Um, I won't beat up on it anymore in terms of the delivery system costs. 
the bottom line is uh, we would have been willing to take a free lunch, uh, but this wasn't one. Uh, and it was a prescription we couldn't swallow. Uh, so meanwhile, everybody sat on the sidelines while watching a food fight within the Democratic caucus. Remember, though, and in another round of this in the rebuttal, I'll talk about a positive approach to this. Uh, the next once-in-a-lifetime opportunity will come again, probably as early as next year. Thank you. I'll ask, thank you. I'll ask Mr. Noah to take on the, that same question. Why or why won't the health care reform bill as we know it today improve health care in America? Um, obviously considering quality, access, and cost in, in your response. Thank you. Oops. Is this you? I'm in some danger of uh, reading your talking points. I was working on it. <laughs> um, I think it's fair to say that none of us loves this bill. Um, it's not a lovable bill. Um, it is a bill that I, I believe should be passed, um, or perhaps I should say should have been passed, uh, since the bill is in very poor health at the moment. Um, I was joking earlier that uh, maybe this whole talk should have been sponsored by the history department. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I will assume for the purpose of this question that, uh, that this bill is still alive. And, and I uh, agree with Tom that I think that uh, even if it dies, uh, we will be having this once in a lifetime opportunity again pretty soon. Partly because uh, this bill, uh, one, there's one very important difference between uh, 2010 and uh, 1994 when Hillary Care went down. This time, industry, for the most part, wants this bill. The insurers don't, but I, I think even the insurers were a little shocked that, uh, that this bill went down as fast as it did. I, 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 uh, I suspect that the insurers were thinking, well, we need this bill, but if we oppose it, that'll maximize our ability to get as many concessions uh, as we can. Um, so as I said, there's a lot to find fault with in the health reform bill, but the bottom line is that it will extend health insurance to somewhere between 31 to 36 million of the 45 million uninsured, according to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Um, that is where about 90% of my argument uh, begins and ends. Uh, this, this bill should become law because uh, if it does nothing else, it will extend health insurance to a lot of people who desperately need it. It will also make health insurance more affordable for the most part to those who don't get it from their employer. Uh, it will not do this, sad to say, by reducing medical inflation. I will concede that the, uh, the talk about bending the cost curve is mostly fantasy. Uh, in fact, it will drive the price of so-called non-group coverage up. But, and this is important, the bill provides enough subsidies to purchasers that a majority of the people participating in this market will receive health insurance at a price that's about 60% below what it is now. Again, these are all the Congressional Budget Office's figures. Uh, the coverage will be better, too. Uh, the bill eliminates a gap in drug coverage under Medicare, the so-called donut hole, so older people will have an easier time paying for pharmaceuticals. That's important. It also extends health coverage by loosening eligibility requirements for the Medicaid program. Uh, the bill prevents insurers from turning customers away based on pre-existing conditions, which even Republicans seem to oppose. And it limits the extent to which they can charge people uh, different rates based on their risk factors. I think Republicans aren't too crazy about that practice either. Uh, the bill prohibits uh, limits imposed by insurers on lifetime health care spending. That should prevent some medical bankruptcies. And it actually dictates to insurance companies that they must spend at least 80 to 85 percent of every premium dollar on health costs. It's called a medical loss ratio. Uh, the provision, which hasn't gotten a lot of attention, may free up uh, some more private dollars for health care, or it might be undone in the regulations. We don't really know. So that's access. Quality, I think, will be uh, mostly unaffected or perhaps improved slightly. The bill will begin a process of collecting data on best medical practices. To be honest, uh, I'm not sure whether that information will make the practice of medicine better or simply more rigid, possibly at the patient's expense. Um, I think that's an open question. 
A lot depends on the details of how the information is gathered and used, and most of that remains to be worked out by regulators. Cost. The bill's supporters say it will lower, lower overall health care spending, and in so doing, lower the federal budget deficit. I don't believe that. But neither do I believe the bill's opponents who say that it will cause medical inflation to skyrocket further. A combination of taxes and planned cuts in Medicare reimbursements to doctors and hospitals will cause the bill to pay for itself over the next decade, according to the Congressional Budget Office. I don't really trust any projections beyond 10 years. Um, now, uh, on this last point, I should say that uh, uh, this is in marked uh, distinction from the way the Republicans handled creating a drug benefit for Medicare back in 2003. Uh, uh, they created the benefit, they didn't pay for it. Um, the Democrats are at least trying to pay for it, and I think they deserve some credit for that. Um, it's, it's, as I say, it is not a great bill. I could uh, go on for two more hours about what's wrong with the bill, but it begins a process that is hugely necessary of getting the government actively involved in addressing some of these inequities. And um, I expect it to be an ongoing process for the rest of our lifetimes. And Mr. Tanner, I would ask that you uh, take the question about why or why not on health care reform and affecting uh, both quality, access, and cost, all three. Well, you know, I actually, when, when I started out, I, I really wanted to, to reach out sort of in the new bipartisan spirit that, you know, was permeating Washington uh, through last night. And unfortunately, you know, as I looked at the bill, and I really tried to find something in it that I liked. And I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I hate everything about this bill, including the periods and semicolons. Uh, the fact is, I, I believe this bill is worse than the status quo in a very great many ways. First of all, even if you accept all the numbers on the numbers of uninsured, it still means that about 85% of Americans currently have health insurance. And according to the surveys, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of them like the insurance they have. So under this bill, could you, as the president repeatedly says, if you have health insurance today and you like it, could you keep it? And the answer is pretty clearly, no, you couldn't. And the reason for this is, so there are several reasons actually, one is that the bill contains an insurance mandate. It actually contains both an individual mandate and an employer mandate. And the individual mandate is a requirement that everyone must buy health insurance. If you don't get it at work, you still have to go out and buy a policy on your own. And the employer mandate is a requirement that businesses must provide their workers with insurance. But if the government's going to mandate insurance, it then has to define what is insurance. I mean, my policy with the million dollar deductible probably doesn't qualify. So these bills spell out exactly what has to be in insurance for it to qualify under the mandate. And they do this at great length. And there's all sorts of benefits that are required to be in there because all the special interests rushed to Washington and demanded that they be included. So you get everything, you know, you get the mental health benefits and drug and alcohol rehabilitation and dental care and vision care, and it goes on and on and on. And if that wasn't even enough, the bills actually then create a commission headed by the Surgeon General who will come up with additional benefits that have to be included in the insurance. So what happens if you have insurance today that you like, but it doesn't have all these benefits that you're now required to have? Well, you will have to give up the policy you have now and buy the new policy, even if it has benefits you don't want, even if the new policy is more expensive, or even if some of those benefits you're morally opposed to. Second, this bill is going to cost a lot. You know, they give you the number of about $900 billion or so. 
Do you remember when 900 billion was actually a lot of money? You know, now it's sort of a rounding error in the latest bailout. But, but those numbers are hugely misleading. For example, one of the things they do is they assume in order to get that 900 billion, they assume that next year, Medicare will be cut by 23%. And then they simultaneously introduced a separate bill repealing that 23% cut. And they said, oh, but that doesn't count against the health care bill. You know, $250 billion, that's a whole separate bill. That's over here. You know, the health care bill is $900 billion over here. You don't have to worry about that. And then what they did was they did a 10-year score. They said, budget, Congressional Budget Office looks at these bills and says, beginning in 2010 this year and going to 2019 over 10 years, how much will it cost? 2000, it costs about $900 billion. The bill doesn't take effect until 2014. Well, actually, the taxes take effect now. But the rest of the bill doesn't take effect until 2014. So they get a 10-year score for six years of spending. Just think how much your home budget would be better, how much better it would be if you could just drop out a couple of weeks. You know, if you actually looked at how much this bill will cost over 10 years of operation, let's say start in 2014 when the bill starts and go to 2023 for the you have 10 real years of, bill, of the bill, it costs two and a half trillion dollars. And they pay for this with a huge amount of new taxes. You heard that the Senate bill has this Cadillac insurance tax, that's an excise tax on insurance that the government thinks is too generous for you. What they don't tell you is that tax, which originally hit about 19%, about one out of every five people will get hit with that tax originally. But that tax is only indexed to regular inflation, not medical inflation, which is even hot, which runs faster than regular inflation. So as your premiums get pushed up, more and more and more people will get hit by that tax. And in about 10 years, about 40% of people will be falling into that tax, getting hit with a 40% excise tax on insurance. Meanwhile, the House just wants to tax small businesses and rich people uh, with a 5.4% uh, surtax, uh, which would give the U.S., by the way, if that was passed, the highest marginal tax rates in the world. Uh, our highest marginal tax rate would be higher than Sweden at, at that point, which doesn't strike me as being a great idea when we're trying to create more economic growth. Second, you will pay more in premiums. Now, one of the ideas that people, they sold this bill on the idea that if we pass health care reform, you're, you know, because health care costs too much, everybody's worried about their premiums going up. We're saying if you can pass health care reform, your premiums will go down. Well, according to the Congressional Budget Office, it says that if we do nothing, Health premiums in the next 10 years, premiums on insurance are going to double. Then they said if we pass this bill, premiums are going to double. Except if you don't get your insurance at work, if you buy it in the individual market, then if we do nothing, premiums will double. And if we pass this bill, they'll go up 13% higher than that. But that's on average because there is these provisions in here, the guaranteed issue says that you have, insurance companies have to sell you insurance even if you're sick. You know, that's a little bit like you could drive your car into the tree and then pick up the phone and call Geico about that insurance policy you used to meant to get. Why would anyone buy insurance when they're healthy if you can wait until you get sick before you buy it? But it also contains this provision that requires that everyone pay the same premium for insurance, this community rating provision. The change. So what that means is that if you're older and sicker, your premiums are probably going to go down. If you're young and healthy, your premiums are going to go way, way up. Some studies suggest they could go up to 75 or 95 percent higher if you're young and healthy, because you're going to have to subsidize older and sicker people on this. Third, can you keep your current doctor? Well, maybe. There's nothing in this that prohibits you from keeping your doctor. On the other hand, we already know that 12% of doctors in this country won't accept Medicare patients because the reimbursement rates are so low. And we know that about a third of doctors won't accept Medicaid patients because reimbursements are too low. In fact, there was just a study 
uh, I just read about it in the paper here, just came out in Michigan, that 23% of uh, people who graduate from medical school in Michigan leave the state to practice because the reimbursement rates are so low. So if we create a system in which we squeeze out private insurance because we created these pub a public option or something like that, but we force more people into a government plan, and that government plan reimburses the same way that Medicare and Medicaid do, do we then run through the risk of forcing more doctors out of the system and making it impossible for you to see the doctor you wanted to see? Possibly. And then finally, are there rationing plans in the bill? Well, with all due respect to the former governor of Alaska, there are no death panels in this bill. The fact is, there's nothing in there that puts grandma on an iceberg and sails her out to sea. But when you look at these cost projections, when you look at the current government programs, Medicare, 50 to 100 trillion dollars in debt, when you look at this bill and you see the cost, two and a half trillion over 10 years, more, if you look at the unfunded liabilities of it, are around nine trillion going forward, and you say, can they pay the benefits they're promising in the future? And then you think that they may squeeze out private insurance and force more and more people into the government programs that can't pay the promised benefit. Then you realize the structures are in place that will inevitably lead to rationing down the road. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. So uh, we are now in this in the time of rebuttals, and I would uh, like everyone to have five minutes to rebut what anyone said. But I I think that there are many in this audience uh, who really want to know about this individual mandate question and employer mandate question. So I'm, I, I would ask in your rebuttal if you might uh, take on what Mr. Tanner described about um, whether individual mandates will preclude individuals uh, from keeping their insurance and or their doctors, of course, um, adding in whatever you wish. And I, and I would ask to start with Mr. Miller. OK. Uh, I mean, the individual mandate is not really a mandate to get anything. It's basically a penalty a financial penalty on people who don't do something. Uh, now, you can try to steer them in that direction, but you could call it a tax on the uninsured. Uh, sorry, you're unlucky. Uh, and it's, uh, at least in most of the iterations, fairly soft as a uh, first phase. Uh, on, from the left side of the spectrum, the interesting reaction is how repulsed of those who thought they were going to get single payer felt at the idea they would be forced to pay money to the very private insurers they despised and probably make them uh, better off than they were before. So I, I think the politics of both the individual mandate and the employer mandate, although they could have been more onerous and worse, uh, somewhat short-circuited uh, within the, uh, the, the Democratic uh, Party uh, process of trying to find sufficient votes for it. I have kind of a, a two broad takeaway points uh, before I rebut myself on being too negative uh, about uh, the, uh, the legislative process. One is more of a clinical reaction, and, and the other is more of a pop cultural one. Uh, I remember doing an interview at the BBC in the fall, and it turned out it recurred back again. The thinking about this legislative process in one sense from its advocates was kind of like going through, in, in those in the medical community, those going through the five stages of grief. Uh, we, we, we saw the original denial, uh, then some anger. It bounced back and forth. Uh, we're kind of right now at about the bargaining stage on its way to depression, uh, but we're a little short thus far of final acceptance. But we're going to get there and move on to a better day ahead. On the pop cultural front, as we see that, is it dead yet? Uh, you, you know, zombie films have had a real comeback in the, in the pop culture. Uh, Zombieland was wonderful, but I like to go back to Night of the Living Dead, the original classic version. Uh, in, the, in the black and whites, uh, where if you remember the actual you know, nature of the zombies are, uh, not only do they rise up and feed on human flesh, but, but they are brain dead. But the only way to really kill them off, even though they're brain dead, is you have to actually knock out their brains. Uh, and we haven't quite gotten there yet, uh, but I believe we're getting close to some resolution on that front. Originally, I thought it was going to be more of a vampire analogy with you know charismatic villains, very popular in the Twilight series. But the tanning tax was a giveaway. This was not being sponsored by <laughs> vampires. All right, what do we do instead? 
the first recommendation is not dive right back into the dog pile immediately. Uh, clean yourself off. Uh, take a pause and think about what's going on here. And remember, as uh, pivoting is occurring uh, by all parties, it really does matter what's happening in a larger economy. That's what drives a lot of the most aggravated problems in the healthcare sector. But it's more about fixing our overall economy and then doing other things than getting it backwards and compounding the problems of getting uh, on the upside on the economy. Uh, all these reactions about what people don't like is not some type of you know, robust mandate for whatever a Republican Party puts out or recent Republican parties have been uh, of saying is there. So it's not kind of like, let's do the opposite and we're just fine. Uh, but the problems in, in politically accepting this, it was not the process, it was not the messaging, it was that people found out what the policy was and they didn't like it. That was the problem, not kind of the optics. And if we just said it a little differently or loudly, or did one more speech, it would come out different. So how do we you know, reverse this a little bit? Uh, oh, so a, a friend and a co-writing partner of mine, uh, Jim Capretto, was just mentioning, uh, you know, the health care problems we have to address are real. It's just that the solutions proposed for them were the ones that were fantasies. So when we go back to thinking about how do we deal with these real problems, when we start, we have to think about realistically, not pretending the imaginary, how to get more decisions, at least the initial ones, not all of them, back in the hands of patients and consumers where it means something and you have the ability to do something with those decisions. People are going to need agents. They're going to need people they can trust, someone they can elect to maybe defer or default to because you're not going to be an expert on your own. But we have to start in that direction, which is the exact opposite of how we approach this. We need to recognize resource limits. Uh, that's why we need to do things differently and more efficiently than we're currently doing. We need to do it better because we can't afford as much waste as we've been able to afford as a rich country in the past. Uh, there are no absolute ceilings on what you can or should or might spend on health care with your own money. But when it comes down to public money, there's some real limits in that regard, and we can't afford to squander it. We do need to get better value so that regardless of where you are and how much you can command, everybody has a chance to do better. Not perfectly, not to get the best possible, but there's a chance always to improve and we can give some tools in that regard. We're going to have to insist on more accountability across the board, two-way accountability, not, oh, you have to do this for me and I'm not responsible. Whether it's between patients and physicians, the government and the taxpayers it makes promises to, the payers and the people they're paying on behalf of, you have to go in that regard. Well, that was a fast five minutes. All right, we always run short of short uh, positive things to say, so I won't say anything more positive except in this pre-existing condition thing. And uh, there are small problems which can be dealt with. I've written about them. You can change incentives so that basically if you don't do the responsible thing, you get dinged and you pay more. It's called continuous coverage. We can do it in the individual market. High-risk pools need to be real where you actually pay money for people who are the most vulnerable. If we could subsidize the people who are most vulnerable and target them first and let everybody else find out what the real cost and price of things are, we'd be a lot better off. Thank you. Mr. Noah, ask for your rebuttal, please. Um, uh, well, let's start with the, the notion that uh, uh, Barack Obama has broken his promise that, um, that uh, if you like the insurance you've got, you can keep it. Um, I, I, the bill really doesn't do anything actively to, uh, to, to uh, end that status quo. Um, the, the, the problem is that... Uh, the status quo is in danger no matter what happens, as, as Obama himself has explained more than once. Um, we're seeing an erosion of employer-based health insurance in this country now. I think over the last decade, something like we've seen about a sort of seven percent reduction in uh, the percentage of people who get employer-based coverage. Employers are getting out of this business, even with a substantial uh, tax exclusion for health benefits. Employers are saying. It's still too expensive. Um, we are going to cut back, and they are cutting back, both in the quality uh, of the health plans they're offering and in the number of people that they're insuring. So um, this notion that you can sort of freeze this moment of time and uh, you can hang on to the health benefits that you've got today um, uh, from your employer, uh, that's just completely false. It's a fantasy. Um, the, um, 
Michael was sort of talking about uh, the uh, standardization uh, of insurance under the regulatory scheme in the bill, and um, you know, I, I yes, I hate to break it to you, Michael, but uh, your one million dollar deductible is not going to qualify, and um, uh, you know, uh, it's you have a quirky taste in health insurance is all I can say. Most people wouldn't want a million dollar deductible. Um, uh, the uh, Medicaid savings uh, that are in the bill, or Medicare savings, rather, in the bill, um, uh, a lot of people have said those are never going to, uh, uh, we're never going to see those. And it is true that while this was going on, Congress separately, largely for political reasons, uh, 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 gave uh, doctors a buy on, on planned cuts in Medicare reimbursement rates. But um, in general, there's actually, it's part of this sort of larger cynicism about government. The government actually doesn't work as badly as most people think it does. It is, uh, it is uh, certainly imperfect. It certainly has lots of problems. But there is an easy cynicism about government that has become very fashionable. And um, it's just not justified by the facts. In this particular instance, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities did a study. They looked back for 20 years uh, on Medicare, planned Medicare cuts. And they found uh, that uh, the conventional wisdom on this item uh, was completely wrong. Um, I'm looking at their data here. Um, Well, I seem to have misplaced my... But the, the, what they found is, looking back 20 years, um, in almost every instance, 100% uh, of the savings had been realized. The one exception, I think, was a, uh, a Medicare cut in 1997, where 80% of the planned cuts uh, were realized. So our cynicism about government's ability to impose some controls on its spending is unjustified. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that the government is going to step up to the plate every time, but uh, it is not correct to automatically assume that the government can't cut social spending or health care spending. Um, the, um, the, the premiums uh, will double in 10 years, uh, uh, whether we have health insurance or not. That is uh, one of the great failures of the health insurance bill, that it, it will not lower uh, uh, premiums. Um, and, and that was a major concern at the start. And um, this bill really does nothing, virtually nothing, to address it. The one thing it does do to address it uh, is the Cadillac tax, which I think all of us, I'm not sure, certainly Michael and I both agree, is a terrible tax, poorly designed. Um, uh, based on a completely false notion of uh, what drives costs in health insurance in the first place. Um, the Health Affairs did a study this month, the magazine uh, Peer Review Journal, uh, Health Affairs did a study that found, um, I think it was less than 10% of the cost uh, of a health insurance plan had to do with the generosity of its benefits. It's almost entirely determined by the demographics of the, the people who are being insured. So the Cadillac tax is built on a, a completely false premise uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, health, uh, that the more expensive health insurance plans are uh, plans in which um, uh, uh, employers are indulging their employees with, with, with opulent benefits. Does anybody here in the auditorium have an opulent health insurance plan? Raise your hand. There's one in the back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The American Enterprise Institute is able to provide an opulent they health insurance plan. too much to our HSA. <laughs> uh, we have one person in, uh, what, 250. So, um, uh, but the point is that, uh, yes, the, uh, the bill doesn't do anything to address uh, medical inflation and the, the rise in premiums. Um, I would argue that's because the bill does not include a public option. We, we didn't talk much about that tonight because it got knocked out of the bill. Um, it was too controversial. Uh, too controversial in Congress, I should say. Uh, the bill sort of consistently won a majority support in polls. In fact, 
the public option is more, more uh, popular than uh, health uh, reform itself. Um, so there was a strange disconnect, I think, there between Congress and the public. The public wants the government to get in the business of providing health insurance in order to compete with private health insurers and drive uh, prices down. But that, that, that's not in the bill. Uh, they couldn't sell it to uh, 60 senators, and, uh, and so uh, it's not in the bill. Um, the, um, uh, I also want to address Michael complaining that uh, on the one hand, he was saying the government can't control costs. On the other hand, he was complaining that the reimbursement uh, level uh, in Medicare is, is too low, and it, it, it uh, reminded me of the, uh, the old joke, uh, the food in this restaurant is terrible and such small portions. Um, uh, I, I think you can argue one or the other, but it's difficult to argue both at the same time. Um, uh, the final uh, issue I'd want to address is this question of whether the bill will lead to rationing. Um, uh, rationing is sort of the third rail of this whole discussion. You can't uh, politicians can't talk about it without having everybody get hysterical. But of course, the reality is, one way or another, uh, health care costs get controlled. Um, right now, they get controlled by private insurers. Um, and it is true. Amazingly, polls show uh, that, uh, as Tom pointed out, polls show that, uh, that the public actually uh, trusts private insurers to treat them better than the government. I think the public is out of its mind on this question. I certainly speaking for myself, uh, I trust the government better than I trust Aetna to uh, uh, have my best interests at heart when it comes to providing me coverage. Uh, if only because Aetna is in business to uh, make money and to reward shareholders, whereas the government uh, is in business to be responsive to voters. I'm a voter. And if I'm getting screwed by uh, a government health plan, uh, I have some recourse with the government. Limited recourse, imperfect recourse, yes, but I have some. With Aetna, I have none. Um, so uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the rationing question is, is a red herring. Um, one way or another, we limit uh, spending on health care. It's just a question of how we do it. Thank you. Government is responsive to voters? <laughs> Where? When? <laughs> uh, the, the reality is, uh, you know, Aetna may be terrible, but I can fire Aetna. Uh, haven't had much luck firing most of the folks in Washington recently. Although, who knows, that might change soon. We, That's we, can, we can hope. District of Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> that, good, that does say something. Uh, second, in, in terms of, it's true, uh, most people probably don't want a million dollar deductible. Uh, although, if Bill Gates wanted one, who cares? Uh, but a lot of people, especially if they're young and healthy, might want a fairly substantial deductible. They want to, make, want to get what used to be called major medical. You know, something that protects them if they come down with cancer or they got hit by a truck. Uh, they may not want something that covers uh, every possible checkup they get or every little thing. They may, they may want to take the much lower premiums for getting a kind of catastrophic policy and put that money aside in the bank someplace, spend some of it on stuff, that the other things that they want to spend money on, and keep some of it aside for medical needs if they have it. They couldn't under this bill. Those type of cop policies are basically wiped out health savings accounts wiped out, flexible spending accounts limited, those high deductible policies basically prohibited under, under this bill. And then finally, let me, let me finish up with this whole question of rationing, because I actually agree. Rationing is sort of inevitable in health care. Now, people often ask me, they say, is health care a right or a privilege? And I answer that it's neither one. Health care is a commodity. There's only so many doctors, so many hospitals, and so much money. We will never, we never have, and we never will, provide everyone with all the health care they could possibly desire. It is simply impossible. 
Therefore, health care, like any other commodity, and a finite commodity, will be rationed. The question isn't, will it be rationed, but who will make the rationing decision? Today, too often that decision is made by an insurance company, and I agree, that's a terrible situation. But simply moving that rationing decision to the government doesn't make it any better. Much better decision, much better is to return more of that money to you as an individual and let you make those rationing decisions for yourself. And then we can subsidize people who don't have enough so that they can play in the game. But ultimately, the value you receive for your health care is an idiosyncratic decision. It matters to you. People have different tolerances for pain. Different. Some people want to be out of the hospital tomorrow. Some people don't care. Some people need to get back to work that afternoon. They want an in and out. Some people, could, they take three weeks off. It's fine with them. People have differing values when it comes to rationing. I'll give you a classic example that a lot of men in the audience probably have heard about or experienced. You have prostate cancer. If you go to a prostate surgeon, they'll tell you the only value is you have to cut it out. Has 100% 20-year survival rate. You've got to do it. Got to get the surgery. But go to someone who does radiation therapy, and they'll say 97, 98% 20-year survival rate, but you don't have the side effects that go with the surgery. Which of those procedures is valuable? Which of those should be the one decision, cookie cutter, one size fits all that we impose on everyone? I don't want a third party making those decisions. I want to make them for myself. Healthcare is some of the most personal, private, and important decisions in your life. I think health care decisions should be made by you with your doctor. But you don't get to do that as long as someone else is paying the bill. You know, when you take your dog to the vet, your dog doesn't get a whole lot of say in what's going on. Because the dog isn't paying. And today when you go to the doctor, you don't always get a whole lot of say about what's going on because you're not paying. The government's paying 50 cents out of every health care dollar spent in this country. They get the biggest say. And insurance companies, most often paid by your employer, are paying another 37 cents. You're paying 13 cents. And you're only getting 13 cents worth of say. I think we should move that money back to you, let you pay, have more of the money, pay more of the bill, and have more of the say. You should be in charge. No one else. Thank you all very much. So I, I'm going to bring it back. Uh, we have a, a, one more round of rebuttals for that past discussion, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So I hope you audience members are ready to ask some uh, pointed questions to our panelists here. But Mr. Miller, I'd ask that you uh, take on the next set of rebuttals, uh, particularly potentially responding to Mr. Tanner around this idea of rationing. Uh, if patients are not necessarily the experts, who should be rationing care? And I was about to give some real rebuttals to Tim, but I'll get to that in just Please a second. Please do. Uh, look, there are a, a fraction of us who want to know everything and make all our choices and do that and be very aggressive about it, and that's terrific. We need those folks as the most informed marginal consumers who can drive a lot of us in the right place. But the essential thing is to have the chance as a patient to choose who might be choosing for you, who you trust, who you will get some help from, who you rely upon. Often, it's a relationship you have with a primary care physician, someone you respect in the medical community. It may even be on occasion your employer or your insurer, or if you happen to be of that bent, you're for your favorite local politician. That's okay, because we're all different in terms of where we want to say, in the same way that Mike vividly pointed out that there's not a single answer on all these dimensions for how you're going to assess this. But we first have to have a system where if you want to know more, if you want your consent to be more informed, that we've got the ability to 
allow you to find out what you think you need to know according to your preferences and your tastes, and then the system is responsive because it's supposed to be all about the patient, but actually it's all about everybody else most of the time. So that, that, that's the basic, I mean, the, the, and I don't like to use the word rationing, it's what this, the real core essentially is, who's going to make the decisions as to how to allocate these resources? There are a lot of them, but, but who, who does that allocation decision? Is it some type of centralized you know, command structure? Or do we finally figure out a way that there's a little bit more of a decentralized, multiple party way to make these decisions so that we're constructing something that are real markets, not fake markets, where you have enough to make the decision and you're, you own and you're responsible for your choices in that regard. Now, just a couple other quick things. Tim talked about the, uh, the Medicaid uh, cost uh, constraints and how these, these savings were real. Well, if they turn out to be real, it's going to be a case of double vision because they've been counted twice. They've been counted as saving Medicare and also paying for all this entitlement. So it's a little blurry when you're seeing twice, even if they do materialize. But most of them are formulaic, automatic things. If you assume something that happened before will happen again, you can believe that. Um, just a, a, give me a break here. Uh, everything's been pounded on the Cadillac tax, and it's a stupid way to construct a decent idea. I've actually read these studies. And I know the methods in which they do it, because similar methods on another study I did. There are limits to this approach called actuarial value, which take a standardized population and pretend that everybody else is like that, which can contort this. This is all about, if you did it the right way, sending signals on the margin for people who have different amounts of preference for paying if they know the real price as to what would happen. The better approach would be to abolish all of the tax subsidies and then help the people who need help in a separate means and be generous about it. But we've done it in a distorted way, and that's why we beat up on the Cadillac tax. No one is ever going to get a tax subsidy for everything they spend on health care, as much as they imagine it. It's going to be limited in any case. This is just a way to stop it from escalating further with some limits on it, but done in a very imperfect way. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask Mr. Noah and, and Mr. Tanner. We, we would like to get to the audience questions, so if you could have a shorter rebuttal than we expected, that would be helpful. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I, I don't have too much to add except to point out that obviously all three of us are, are um, pandering shamelessly to a Michigan audience by attacking something called a Cadillac tax. <laughs> um, uh, 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 yeah, I, I, I'm at risk of going over some of the same points I, I made earlier. I, I um, uh, uh, you know, how you calculate uh, the uh, Medicare, Medicare, not Medicaid uh, cuts, um, you know, uh, it's quite possible that there's some double counting in, in, in what the, the, uh, uh, the cuts are. But um, uh, the underlying point still remains. It's been documented that there have been uh, five or six uh, major scheduled Medicare cuts over the last 20 years, and those cuts uh, did take place. I'm trying just to make a simple point that the automatic assumption that the government uh, can't cut Medicare or other social spending is incorrect. Um, and while I do want to uh, demonize the Cadillac tax, um, I do not find it appalling that the uh, health care bill does include uh, roughly half a trillion in, uh, in taxes. It's true. Um, uh, the, um, we uh, we uh, gave away a lot of tax revenue in the last 10 years uh, with the Bush tax cuts. And uh, the amount that's being taken back in this context is significantly less than that. Um, uh, the, uh, the economy managed to do uh, uh, better than well um, when the top marginal rates uh, were significantly higher than they are today under the Clinton administration. Um, uh, and <clears throat> the, um, I you know, consider it a virtue of the uh, health, health reform bill that, um, uh, and I'm going to repeat a point here, I consider it a virtue that the Democrats seem to have found a way uh, to pay for this piece of social legislation. This is something that, uh, again, the Republicans 
uh, failed miserably at when they expanded uh, uh, the Medicare, when they created the Medicare drug benefit in 2003. Um, uh, I, I don't see that that's something to apologize for. I have my own preferences about how the tax revenue should be raised. Um, I, uh, I would prefer uh, that the, we adopt the surtax, the millionaire surtax that was proposed by the House. Um, I am not someone who makes little air quotes when I uh, use the term rich people. Um, I am perfectly comfortable with rich people paying more in taxes. Um, uh, so uh, again, I, I, I am in the strange position here of, of defending a bill that I am uh, uh, fairly lukewarm on in many respects. But um, uh, as I said earlier, uh, it's very, very important to extend uh, health insurance to the people who desperately need it in this country. And I think everything else is just details. Uh, just two fairly quick points. One is on the uh, on the taxes. The, the Bush tax cuts are going to expire uh, this year and next. Uh, and there's no prospect for their being extended. So they're, they're going to go away. This would be a tax on top of that. And it would mean in 38 states, including Michigan, the top marginal tax rate would be above 50%. In some states, it would be close to 58%, much higher than the Clinton years when we had uh, economic growth or, or the Bush years. Or In fact, I think you'd have to go all the way back probably to the before Jack Kennedy that you had uh, marginal tax rates this high. They would be the highest marginal tax rates in the world, as I say, higher than, higher than Sweden. Uh, the second is in terms of we should support this bill just because it expands coverage. Uh, and I, I believe all things equal, it's better to be insured than, than not, and we should try to expand coverage. But that might not be the most efficient use of the dollars involved. Uh, there is no evidence, if you look at the academic literature, that if you have a marginal dollar to spend, spending that on, new, on health insurance is necessarily the best bang for your buck in terms of improving the health overall of the population. Uh, you might be better off spending that on clin uh, free clinics or community, uh, community health centers. You might be better off spending it on education campaigns to get people to stop smoking or, or to lose weight or things like that. There might be a lot of better marginal uses for that dollar than simply expanding health insurance. So we shouldn't necessarily fixate on the solution to health care and the health problems facing this country is just to get a more pieces of paper in people's hands that says they have health insurance. After all, we do know that countries all around the world uh, hand people a piece of paper that says they have universal coverage, and then you stand in line to see a doctor. Thank you. I appreciate that we rounded out the discussion uh, talking about what health really means and, and, and going beyond health care. So thank you for that last comment. I'm now going to invite the audience to come, and if you wouldn't mind uh, making sure that your voices are heard in the microphone. My name is Christopher Deming, and I have a question for Mr. Tanner. Um, what would the political climate need to look like in order to put forth a proposal to allow interstate sell of uh, health insurance? Well, I, I think that can be done both at the federal level. It is an appropriate federal measure. This is a matter of interstate commerce, and there has been a bill introduced by John Shattuck of Arizona to do this uh, in the House. Uh, it's also attracted a fair amount of Democratic support. A number of Democrats have suggested that this might be an area that could be included in a compromise bill when they go back and try to rework this. So, uh, so I do think that's a possibility. Uh, but I think a better chance is going to be on a state-by-state -state basis, where states either uh, getting together and creating an interstate compact, uh, although that would ultimately require congressional approval, but uh, Michigan get together with Illinois and Wisconsin, Minnesota, form a little group or something to, to do this, or Ohio. Uh, make make sure it's uh, approval in one state in one of the states reciprocal for the others, or it could be done on a nationwide basis where a state like Michigan could simply open it up and say insurance approved anywhere for sale in the United States is approved for sale in in our state. The problem is you have sort of a bootlegger and Baptist uh, coalition fighting this. You have the insurance commissioner and the regulators who don't want to give up the power to regulate insurance in their state, and you have the insurance cartels within the states that don't want to compete with other insurance from other states, and the two get together and tend to, to operate to block this. Thank you. Next. I'd like to direct this to all three panelists. Um, 
I think it was Tom Reed's recent book, The Healing of America, who visited you know, several industrialized countries. And there were two things that impressed me in his book. One, one was, um, in every case, it, he found that those countries had agreed that healthcare was a moral issue and not a commodity. And when they, when they reached a consensus on that, then they started to move forward in trying to provide care for everyone. And the second thing that he discovered was um, the private insurance companies were all not-for-profit. And that was one, one way that they've been able to um, control health, health costs. So I would just like your reaction to those um, two things. Uh, there's sentiments by many people that say we should not be enacting morality through politics and government. Uh, so if it's a moral issue, I think we should do the virtuous thing uh, through society and, and do what we believe is right. But in fact, people speak uh, two tongues on this. It's the moral issue for someone else to do it, but not for me. Uh, so that, 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 that's the first reaction. Um, in terms of profit and nonprofit, it depends how you count. Uh, nonprofits have operating margins. Politicians in government have profits also. It's called vote buying. Uh, you know, there's different ways in which you, you convert a profit in one form or another. So everybody is seeking to enhance their interests in different ways, but there's no magic in terms of labeling it profit or nonprofit as if there's a vast amount of savings. What we need to do is have people looking for those who serve them better and to patronize them. If it turns out it's a nonprofit, enroll in that plan. If it turns out it's a government plan, you, you should be perfectly free to get in it. But if someone else thinks differently, you should not be dragging them kicking and screaming into what you thought was what worked for you in order to enlist them in your particular moral crusade. Let me just point out that about 40% of American insurance companies, health insurance companies, are nonprofits. Uh, mutual insurance companies, by definition, are, are nonprofits. Uh, some insurance companies are co-ops. Uh, blues, the Blue Cross, in most states, not all, but in most states, Blues are nonprofit insurance companies. Uh, so simply being a nonprofit doesn't necessarily guarantee lower prices or better, better, better service. Uh, so I'm not necessarily moving to that. In terms of other countries, uh, you actually find, as I said, two types of countries that out there. You find those like Britain, Canada, that tend to have significant rationing uh, by queue, essentially the long waiting lists uh, to get care. 750,000 people are waiting admission to National Health Service hospitals in Britain right now. Every year they cancel 50,000 surgeries in Britain because the patient got too sick uh, on the waiting list to bother to go forward. Uh, the Canadian Supreme Court, which is not necessarily a, known as a right-wing bastion, uh, ruled in 2005 in a case striking down part of their national health care law uh, said it was undisputed by the Canadian government that the people were dying on the waiting list uh, up there. And then there are systems actually in other countries that actually work fairly well, France, the Netherlands, Switzerland particularly. Uh, those are countries that have a high degree of consumer cost sharing that essentially allow markets to set prices uh, and the government largely operates not to, not to run the system but to, to subsidize people to play within the system uh, to, to some extent based on income. Uh, well, I just want to say I'm glad you brought up the Tom Reed book. It's, uh, it's great. It's called uh, The Healing of America, and everybody should read it. It's, it's, uh, I have a bias towards uh, 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 books that approach this from a journalistic point of view. Tom uh, had a bum shoulder, and he took it from country to country and just asked doctors in different countries what he should do about his bum shoulder and uh, use that in part to, to diagnose the different health systems around the world. It was really an ingenious device. And he has a lot of insight in his book uh, about how uh, different countries do it. Uh, on part one of your question, uh, the fact that other countries view this as a moral issue, I would answer, well, of course it's a moral issue. Um, uh, uh, the question of whether uh, we let people live or die, uh, uh, the question of whether we provide them medical care that they need is a moral issue. We may not, of course, be able to provide what they need, but when we fail to provide people who need health care, uh, uh, to provide health care to people who need it, um, it is a terrible moral failure in the richest country that the world has ever known. Um, and uh, so, of course, these other countries view it as a moral issue. 
Now, healthcare uh, is also a commodity, it's true. Uh, but in, in uh, regulating that commodity, we must never lose sight of the moral issue. It's a different kind of commodity. It is uh, literally something that uh, uh, determines whether people will live or die. Um, uh, the question of sort of nonprofits and regulation, uh, nonprofits rather, I, I brought that up uh, earlier. Yes, these sort of other countries uh, that operate uh, on a private uh, system do tend to have, um, uh, uh, almost always have nonprofits. And, um, and yes, it is also true that about 40% of the market in the U.S. is nonprofit, and a lot of these nonprofits act very much like for profit companies. Um, but the other part of the formula that Reed identified in these other countries is that the governments regulate uh, these nonprofit insurers to a degree that has never been considered uh, in any uh, 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 proposal that's come before uh, Congress, certainly not in the last 20 years. So the, so the formula that other countries use is, yes, nonprofit, but also very, very heavy regulation. Uh, you could argue that to some extent they've reduced these private entities to utilities. Um, uh, but uh, so that explains the discrepancy that, uh, that's described here. I, I wanted to add that um, in a former life I was a public opinion researcher and to the question of morality, uh, if you ask the American public uh, whether they believe health care is a human right, uh, about 90% say yes, in fact it is. If you ask them whether they would be willing to pay uh, for that right, uh, you drop the support for uh, paying for that right about 20%. So the question really then becomes who pays for it. I think all of the uh, panelists here have dealt with that in one way or another, but that also becomes a huge dilemma uh, when we're thinking about um, this kind of double consciousness that the American public has around it being a right. Much of the focus tonight has been on um, making healthcare more accessible by changing the payment mechanisms, so who's paying the bills. Um, but I think that maybe even more fundamentally, um, there needs to be a, a shift towards changing how healthcare is delivered and, and lowering costs at the point of, of care. And I know that the talk's not so much on, on quality, but I'd like to kind of tie it in with the first question that you guys were asked. Um, and what is the role of government in lowering the cost of healthcare by changing the, the delivery mechanisms, looking at it at the point of care as opposed to at the point of payment? There's been a lot of uh, hand wringing and uh, theorizing as to how we're all going to coordinate care and get away from the stupid fee-for-service system. Uh, and we're going to legislate these products, which may not appear in nature, but do appear in the minds of uh, legislators. Now, there's some wisdom in all of these approaches. And I actually find a lot of the efforts, experiments, attempts in the bill as good probes in the right direction. We need to do something better. But you always have to not confuse the means with the ends. It's more important to be able to find a better way to signal who's doing a better job and be able to communicate how others can learn to do as well or close in that direction and be rewarded for it. And why are the incentives to do that than trying to preordain what that exact structure is? There was a paper just I was reading the other day talking about the three uh, most you know, well-recognized uh, sub awards for integrated healthcare systems. And it turned out all three of them were fee for service. Now, they operated a lot smarter and differently within the fee-for-service system, and they did the right thing. It was the Nebraska hospital uh, system. It uh, was also, uh, I'm trying to remember the other one. Uh, the point being that if we begin to focus on who's producing better outcomes than other folks more, most of the time, have robust set of multiple measures in that regard, and then also measure, well, what are the all-in costs from doing it, and let people go ahead and find better care if you can arm them with the right information and have the signals point in that direction. That's a lot better than trying to wire a particular performance system. The other part of this, which we always forget, as much as important as on the delivery health systems, is we've got to make investments in other places. We've got to have, get earlier into this process. There are very important investments are necessary in prenatal care, early childhood development, 
the whole process of education where we're changing the time horizons and preferences of individuals so they're going to have better behaviors which lead to healthier lives and that's going to produce the health which we then, our very expensive system tries to intervene at the last moment and goes, well you have to have health care otherwise you're going to die. We have to change, not getting to that point where it's just in time, fix it at the most expensive stage, but think of ways to use a wider portfolio of investments and incentives to produce the better health we all say we want, but sometimes we don't act as if we value it the way we say others should pay for it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think you raise what is probably the hardest question in, in this debate, which is how do you control uh, costs uh, by doctors and hospitals? And uh, uh, the bill, um, as Tom says, it contains a lot of experiments that may pay off, they may not pay off. Certainly, uh, if there is a payoff, it'll be over the long term. They are not going to contribute significant savings over the 10-year period that, that CBO has looked at. Um, the uh, uh, you know, when I think about this question, uh, I, uh, you know, I inevitably come back to uh, uh, the need, uh, my belief that the government needs to uh, uh, play a much larger role in uh, either uh, regulating or um, providing uh, health insurance directly. Uh, the one thing that we do know works is that when the government gets involved, in, in health insurance, it is able to control costs better than the private sector. Medicare's growth rate is, has been lower than the private sector's growth rate. Uh, uh, other countries that have um, uh, uh, single payer or uh, some system that at least in the United States we would call socialized medicine, they are better at controlling costs than we are. They're better at controlling costs, and at the same time, they usually deliver, uh, deliver uh, 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 better mortality rates. Um, so uh, that's all I know in terms of an ultimate solution. How to get from here to there, uh, I have no clue. I don't think that this is uh, really an issue that's going to be addressed uh, in the current round. Uh, let me, let me just make, make two quick points. One is if you wanted to pick a health care system that does everything wrong as far as reimbursement goes, uh, it has very minimal consumer cost sharing, so consumers have every incentive to consume as much as possible. It pays doctors on a strict fee-for-service for, for, uh, fee for basis. The more procedures you perform, the more tests you order, the more money you get. In fact, if you make people sicker so they have to come back and see you again, you get paid a second time. It's the Medicare system run by the U.S. government. So the idea that government is going to come in and do this all more efficiently, I, I really have my doubts about. Second, just uh, in terms of other countries doing it cheaper, cheaper than us, a couple of points. One is it's always cheap not to provide care. That, that's ultimately the, the, the ultimate savings. Uh, but second, they're not really, if you, they, they start from a very low base, but if you look at year-to-year -year rises in their cost, it's very close to ours. Uh, it, it's two years old, the latest data I have, but our health care costs in this country are rising at about 5.3% uh, that year, and it was rising at about 4.8 to 4.9 for the OECD countries. So it's a little bit cheaper than ours on a year-to-year -year basis, but not a, not a great deal uh, in, in terms of that. And finally, let me just sort of, try and put lay to rest forever the idea that mortality or life expectancy is a measure of the quality of a healthcare system. Mortality and life expectancy have so many outside factors that come into play when you measure those things like homicide rates, suicide rates, accidents, lifestyle that figure into those sort of things. I mean, after all, if you're talking about life expectancy being the measure of a healthcare system, how do you explain the fact that people in Utah live three years longer than people in Nevada and they have essentially the same healthcare system? Thank you. I actually had a comment about cost control as well. Um, I see anybody over 35 or 40 probably remembers getting bills from your doctor. You had a, you paid your premium to your employer or whatever. You had an office copay, and sometimes you had um, a deductible you dealt with. After that, you didn't really have any other expense that you paid your doctor. The insurance companies were the main negotiator with physicians and hospitals that help control costs. And a few years ago, I started seeing things on, on my doctor's bills that said, uh, here's your, you got to pay your office copay, 
oh, you may be responsible for expenses above what your insurance company will reimburse your doctor for. And I think if you looked at when those things started showing up on people's bills is when we started seeing a skyrocketing costs of um, the health care because there was no more any constraint. It's, it's one thing, you know, I know the free market approach is, oh, you can go in and negotiate. Eh, that doesn't really work that way for health care. I, I disagree with anybody who says you can just go in and negotiate. I mean, you've got appendicitis. You're not going to go from hospital to hospital getting a second opinion for a bid. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, so the insurance companies, people were, you paid a premium to them and you relied on their professional expertise to make this central negotiation process to help control costs. They stopped doing that. They control what they have to pay for their bottom lines or whatever, whether they're a nonprofit or not. But they stopped controlling the overall costs that they put out and consequently things started going up. That's just my anecdotal uh, experience, so I'll let you guys comment. I'll go sit down and listen. Yeah. All right. well, I think you make uh, uh, one good point. Now, what, what actually happened was the public objected to that. Uh, the public, uh, the insurance companies, this was the managed care re resolution, and if you actually look at health care costs, what you see in the 90s was health care costs coming down as we put in managed care, squeezed out some of the inefficiencies. But what happened was doctors, because they weren't being paid by insurance companies, would cut back on procedures and the public started demanding that that couldn't happen. And we started mandating in things like patient's bill of rights and so on to, to stop insurance companies from cutting off the, uh, the physician and demanding that they start reimbursing for more and more services. Uh, the cost started going back up, basically. So this, that's how you ended up back with the insurance companies stopping doing some of the things they were doing to, uh, to hold down costs. Uh, basic came, the politicians got in, once again the government got involved and sort of made a hash of it. Uh, second, as you point out, if you have appendicitis or you're having a heart attack, you can't negotiate for prices, which is, which is pretty true. But only about 10% of costs are emergency care. Only about 10% of all health care, I should say, is, is emergency care. Uh, most health care is either chronic conditions or routine stuff in which you do have a long lead time and you can make some negotiations. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, Indianapolis is the home to Golden Rule Insurance Company, which was the first company to introduce what then medical savings accounts, now health savings accounts, the idea of giving the people the money themselves, having a catastrophic policy above it, and encouraging people to negotiate. Uh, they had a significant market penetration because of so many employees in, in that uh, state. You saw a huge shift in the way hospitals began to treat people. They began to let people know upfront prices. You began to see Mother's Day sales on mammograms where they cut the price in half and you know and stuff in order to get customers in because they were beginning to respond in the way markets do in terms of trying to gain customer share. Um, <clears throat> I don't disagree with uh, uh, with Michael's uh, interpretation of what happened in the 90s and afterwards. Yes, there, there was a big pushback on managed care and insurers threw up their hands and said okay we won't we'll forget about managed care we'll just pass through all these costs in terms of jacked up premiums. I think everybody I think there's general consensus that that's what happened. Um, uh, you know, I would argue that uh, it is logical for the public to uh, trust he uh, health insurance companies less than the government in uh, when it comes to uh, making decisions about the allocation of care. Um, uh, I won't repeat the point I made earlier uh, about that. Um, and uh, I also can't resist uh, saying to Michael, I, 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 you hear it again and again that the reason the U.S. has high mortality rates um, uh, is because of our out-of-control uh, homicide uh, uh, rate and out-of-control uh, car accidents. And um, I just wish one time, one person who, who, who made that claim uh, would be someone who was in favor of either gun control or lowering the speed limit. Uh, I have never heard someone who took that position uh, repeat that statistic. It's called thinning the herd. <laughs> <laughs> Just for effect, give me a break. Um, back to the original question. What we're really talking about is two different levels and, and, and tools for dealing with cost-sensitive decisions. There's a range of spending decisions 
which are more appropriately in the hands of the consumer or the patient at the early stage of what we call discretionary care. Now you can make it more narrow or broader. If you don't want the crudeness of a flat, lumpy, you know, deductible, it's all or nothing, once I'm past this, I pass go, I'm on my way there. You could have a wider range of coinsurance where you're somewhat sensitive to cost as you move further up that ladder, but it's not indefinite. That's why most insurance policies have what are called stop losses, or HMOs pretend they don't have any and they just ration in other ways. Um, but, so there's a decision as to how much you're spending as part of the cost decision. Now, the question was actually pointing to a practice which is not that widespread, or is that not, the option is not exercised there, people basically out of network care. Uh, you go out of network and all of a sudden all bets are off. Whatever was the deal you signed up for, for that particular, whether it's a preferred provider network or a more narrow panel HMO, you got, and sometimes they're not really lower prices, they're the, the real price, but that's the game that's played. By staying within the rules that the insurer negotiated for you, you're getting the deal. If you want something else and you want to order off the menu, it's going to cost you more in that regard. If this was a widespread phenomenon, it would be showing up in the data. The fact is our out-of-pocket costs have been going down, not up, if you actually look at the numbers. Now, that is contrary to thinking that suddenly everybody's paying so much more and nothing's covered and nothing is insured in that regard. What's missing in this whole palette is to have different choices in that insurance decision. That we need to know more about how that insurer is dealing with that end-of-life care that catastrophic illness. They should be approaching it in different ways and they should communicate to you, not in legalese, in policy saying, here's how we make the tough decisions. Here's how we approach it. This is why our premium is lower than someone else. That's what didn't come out of the HMO backlash and the Patient's Bill of Rights to say, it's important to choose that insurance, not for the early costs, but for what they're going to do for you, do for you or to you when it's pretty much in their hands and the other physician goes, because it's beyond your point. We need to know that more transparently. There needs to be a lot more experimentation, differentiation. That's when insurers will be doing their real job as private insurers, and I would support that vigorously. But that's a different end of the spectrum than what we're talking about in terms of these out-of-pocket costs. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Grand Rapids. and as you said, enjoying our wonderful January weather. Um, I've enjoyed the discussion. I am a physician, and I'll have to admit I'm a pretty much a single-payer advocate, and this question is primarily to Mr. Noah, but I'd be glad to hear everybody's opinion. Um, I tried to be very open-minded, realizing that there wasn't going to be much discussion of the single-payer uh, option in uh, health care reform in my experience. Uh, and so I tried to take an open mind and watch the proceedings, but it seems like it's pretty much been a, an exercise in partisan politics and special interest, and I think about the Clinton, uh, what happened in those times, and it's very difficult for me to see how things are going to move forward and get better, and this has special interest to me because it's my job, and. I have to negotiate these things with my patients on a daily basis, and I'd like it to get better. Will it get better, and how can we move past these partisan politics to have these discussions? Uh, well, <clears throat> um, I would say that the, uh, uh, the health care reform bill um, uh, would not take us very far in the direction of single payer. There was a very, very hard push on the part of um, uh, people who think the government should take a larger role, uh, and that group lost. I don't think it's the last fight there will ever be on that matter. Um, I would urge, and I guess this has been a theme for me tonight, I would urge less cynicism about the system. Uh, and, and I fault the president, among others, for, for uh, uh, spreading it. Um, you know, there was a, people were very outraged and shocked by the Cornhusker kickback that went to Ben Nelson. Uh, to get his 60th vote, uh, Harry Reid said, well, for this Medicaid expansion, we're paying 90% of the cost for everybody else. For Nebraska, we'll pay 100%. And um, people thought, this is shocking. This is terrible. We need more transparency in government. First of all, we have a lot more transparency in government than we ever had before, which is why we found out about this deal about 20 seconds after it went down. <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, 
Uh, the other thing is deal making is a part of government. Uh, this has been going on in politics for 200 years. Washington, D.C. wouldn't exist if it weren't for deal making. Washington, D. The capital of the United States is in Washington, D.C. because of a deal struck between the Federalists who wanted to assume state debts and the Southerners uh, who wanted the capital to be in the South. Um, uh, this has a long tradition in American politics. Uh, I'm not saying it's virtuous, it's often unattractive, uh, but it is part of the deal and we have to stop pretending that this is some new awful thing that has crept into our politics. Um, I think rather than exercise outrage over the fact that this bauble got handed to Ben Nelson, maybe we should take a step back and ask why we tolerate uh, rules in the Senate uh, that uh, requires a 60-vote majority to pass just about everything at this point. Uh, this, is, this is a new development. Um, we've had the filibuster for a very long time, but it has not been used anywhere near as frequently as it is today. It is off the charts, and, uh, and uh, it is very difficult to run a government when you need uh, 60 votes for everything. Um, that has to change, and that 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 is on the United States Senate. I would I would really much rather that uh, if people want to generate a little populist anger, it would be anger at the Senate's refusal to operate according to majority rule. Uh, in the okay. interest of, uh, I, I've got a couple of points. Okay. Here, so thank you. I, I know we're running. Make over. them brief. Thank you. We're running. I'll, I'll try to be quick. The first is I actually have a lot of respect for single payer advocates because I, it, it is a coherent system. It is one I disagree with profoundly on, on a lot of grounds, but I actually understand it. I can see where you get from A to Z, it, it, it makes the system. The bill they're currently considering is a hash that makes no sense whatsoever. It's, it's illogical, self contradictory in many places. It is not a coherent system. It's not either a market system or a single payer system. I would much rather have that that was the debate we were having. Second, let me put in a, a plug for partisanship. I think partisanship is just fine. Not, not the sort of red team, blue team partisanship that goes on in Washington, but the idea that there are different philosophical points of view that should hash this out. People who genuinely believe we need more government involvement, that egalitarianism is what it's all about, about equality, and that's what government's role should be, is to spread the wealth. That's a legitimately held view. And then there are other people who believe in individual liberty and free markets, and that's a legitimately held view. And that's not something you can just cut the difference halfway between. Those are two things that should argue, not uh, argue each other out in, in, in terms of a broad philosophical debate, and I think that's good that we have that go on. And then finally, uh, if you're into the filibuster, I'm, I'm not a small d Democrat. Uh, and we don't live in a small d democracy. We live in a republic which includes guaranteed protections for the minority. We don't live in ancient Athens, you know, where 51% of the people voted to enslave 49% of the people they could. Uh, you have all sorts of things that are built into the system designed to slow the government down, to cool passions, to not rush things through on a majority of vote. Can you just imagine a system in which we passed health care reform because the Democrats were in charge? We have a change of elections. We repeal it because the Republicans are in charge. Then we pass it again the next year because the Democrats are in charge. We want to slow things down. We want to protect minority rights. We want to have full and fair debate of things. And we don't want, you know, and frankly, we need a lot less legislating and not a lot more legislating by Congress. Thank you. And I'm going to ask that the last question be asked and uh, that we briefly respond to that. Thank you. I thank you for all your opinions. Uh, actually, uh, I'm a physician, also a family physician, and uh, we could use a lot more primary care in this state. I'm a medical director at an uninsured clinic here in town. Uh, I teach here at the university, and I work in a hospice as a medical director also. Um, I. I hear all your points of view, and yet, um, uh, as I discussed this afternoon, there's more to health care than insurance and doctors and nurses. Uh, there's public health, there's uh, good nutrition, there's safe food, uh, lots of things going to health and community and culture and, and respecting people's rights. Um, but my question is that on the legal side, many things in health care uh, 
uh, go on for years and disrupt the system. I recall one uh, case when I delivered a baby that for eight years the family sued me falsely uh, over a quarter million dollars in legal costs. Luckily, I had insurance. Uh, and about a month in court, and the jury unanimously said, yeah, that, that, that child has a uh, genetic defect. It says right here. Uh, and so you couldn't possibly have caused a birth defect, doctor. So you're free to go. What, what is being addressed as far as this malicious abuse of our legal system to attack doctors, hospitals, nurses, etc.? Uh, the bill had some wonderful uh, mythical demonstration projects. <laughs> Uh, because that's what could basically be agreed to uh, by most of the Democratic senators who are funded by other sources. Now, look, the, uh, whether you want to call it tort reform, medical malpractice, civil justice reform, we have an abysmal, you know, irrational system for dealing with this issue. Uh, we also have a lot of trouble reaching a consensus to move something forward at the national level. There's a half dozen proposals, some a little bit tweaked and more imaginative than in the past, and you can go at one end to the crude side, which works to a limited degree, which is, we know it, you know, damage caps, punitive damage is less so, and that'll bring down your malpractice premiums. It's not the right way to do it, but it, it provides some symptomatic relief. You can get elitist and you can say, oh, we're just going to have these experts in health courts, we'll divert everything over there and the right decisions will be made. Not likely to come about, you've got problems with trial by jury and people wanting to have some, you know, retribution, you know. And there's in between stuff where you can tweak the incentives to do it in a cleaner transaction way, so there's alternative settlement disputes, early offers, apologies. We know the whole litany in that regard. Some states have done it better, particularly when they've run out of doctors and they have no other place to go to. We know the problem's much worse with certain specialties because the tendency is to sue for bad outcomes rather than bad care, so it kill, you know, knocks off the obstetricians, the emergency room folks, the neurologists, the specialized surgeons who they really do, you know, all that's true. Um, we're not going to, you know, get, get, get a solution to this psychological terrorism, which is even greater than the economics of it. Uh, I'm willing to take, you know, any of the solutions out there. I don't think we're going to get them legislated at the national level. Some states will do it, and Godspeed to them that have done that. They've gotten better results in that regard. But it's one of those mismatches between our politics and the underlying reality of health care. The people who are injured don't sue often enough and don't recover. The people who do sue and recover are the wrong ones most of the time. This doesn't deter bad care. It doesn't improve access to care, and it doesn't improve the overall system. Aside from that, it's working pretty well, <laughs> and it's very expensive. Uh, the other thing I'd add is, uh, uh, I actually, there's very little I disagree with there. Uh, the, the, uh, I'm all for tort reform. Uh, the reason it's not in this bill is largely because of politics. Um, uh, and you know, but, but a lot of studies have shown that that, that uh, malpractice does not seem to be driving premiums up. And uh, so, really, as a reporter, I'm, I've, I've lately been in the mode of just sort of asking people, why does this assume uh, such a large uh, place in people's minds? It obviously does have some effect on care. It causes uh, doctors to. Uh, to do things that they wouldn't otherwise Certainly do. Certainly don't deliver babies anymore. Um, I, I, the, the answer I seem to get from doctors, and maybe maybe uh, uh, you can address this, is that it, it, it's not so much the, the actual monetary cost. It is just such awful hell to go through one of these cases. Eight years of living with that? And I can understand that, and it is awful, and... Uh, there should be less access to the courts for ridiculous, petty uh, lawsuits. I completely agree. I'm basically going to agree with, with both my colleagues here. I mean, to some extent, it's hard to measure. Uh, the actual malpractice premiums do not add to the, much of the cost of health care. About half of 1% of the cost of health care might be tri attributable to actual malpractice premiums. Uh, the bigger question is defensive medicine. The doctor orders, orders two more tests because he's afraid that if he didn't order them, he might be sued and so on. But that cost is very hard to measure because it's hard to sort of retroactively prove that that test shouldn't have been ordered. And you can look back and say, well, it turned negative, but you, you didn't know that at the time. It's very hard to. So I see lots of dollar amounts thrown around by both sides, and I don't trust pretty much any of them. Some 
uh, some defensive medicine actually is a good thing. I mean, I don't know, I won't say this is your case, but it used to be a case, especially down south in places like Texas stuff, where Marcus Welby sort of drove around and, and he would deliver a half dozen babies a year. But he wasn't up on the latest OBGYN stuff. He didn't go back and get the credits for it. He didn't really know it. He stopped doing that because of the malpractice premiums. And that's probably a good thing uh, that, that he stopped doing that. So it gets very hard to measure these things. Basically, I'm a federalist. I, I don't want to see this done at the national level. I, I don't think we should have a national malpractice law, but I think states should be much more aggressive in trying to deal with the problems in their systems. You're begging the question, then, why should we have any health care laws nationally? Uh, I don't believe we should. We should. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I would like you to all please join me in thanking our guests tonight. The preceding program is copyrighted by Grand Valley State University. Visit us at gvsu.edu.